I leave it to you. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I need to share my screen first, right? Let me pull up the agenda really quickly first. All right. And then uh, we can transition to your, to your talk. All right, can you see my slide presentation? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, I'm Chris Linus from uh, NASA EOS DIS. I'm a system architect. I'm going to give a, a kind of an intro talk. This is something that I've given here locally at Goddard on how to cloud for Earth scientists. Um, one thing I want to mention at the beginning is uh, the way that we're going to run this is I'm going to go through the talk. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat right away as soon as you think of them. And so you don't forget them, but then we'll actually address them at the end of the session. Um, so this came about because uh, I'm part of a small committee that works with the uh, our, what we call Code 600, 610. It's basically the uh, division or the directorate division, I guess, that has all of our Earth scientists in it. Um, and we were talking about some of the movement that uh, EOS DIS is making to the cloud, as well as some other organizations within Goddard, um, but also noting that in order for, for that to really work, to get the full benefit out of that, uh, Earth scientists were essentially going to have to move with us to a certain degree. Um, and what I'm going to do is try to explain what we, what we mean by that when we say that. So the outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud basics, uh, hopefully do some demystification, but also introduce some really important terms about cloud that will help you understand uh, going forward, what people are talking about when they talk about some of the key concepts. Uh, then I'll talk about the various ways in which Earth scientists might be able to use cloud computing to get their jobs done uh, faster, better, cheaper. Uh, I will talk about the catch because there is always a catch. In this case, there's three or four of them. Um, and then I'll also give you a couple of pointers on how to get started and uh, making that move to cloud with us. So first of all, what cloud computing is. Uh, so a lot of people, particularly the cynics, like to call it, it's just someone else's computer. Um, and to a certain degree, that's true. Um, but if you look past the sort of cynical view, it also means it's somebody else's problem. In other words, you don't have to worry about keeping the machine up and you know, doing all the property tagging and finding the floor space and all of that kind of stuff. That is somebody else's problem to worry about. You just come in and essentially use the, use the computer for pay. Um, and so the model that we're talking about here is really more of a renting model than an owning model. Uh, so it's sort of like, you know, when, when you're trying to move your apartment, uh, yeah, you could go out and buy a box truck, but then you're stuck with that box truck forever. It's much easier to go out and rent a box truck for that one weekend, along with some friends and some pizza, um, because it's going to be way bigger than your SUV, which is just not going to work for an apartment move. Um, so another example is, you know, if you're trying to get to from one place to another place fast, um, you get a seat on an airplane. Now, a lot of money goes into the running that airplane, you know, designing it, building it, flying it, uh, money that you could never afford, and no matter how much you spend on your fast sports car. And it's still going to get you there several times faster than that fast sports car will. Um, another way to look at it is it's computing a la carte. Um, and so here's a case where you're really only paying for the parts of the computing that you're actually going to use. Um, so if all you need is just a little tiny computer, you can use just a little tiny computer. And it's going to be cheaper than if you need a really big computer. Um, if you don't need a lot of storage, you just pay for a little tiny bit of storage. Whereas if you need a big piece of storage, then you pay for that big piece of storage. And still, you only pay for the time that you're using that storage. Um, and then the last thing, and this is actually going to take a little bit more discussion, so don't worry about it too much just yet, but uh, cloud computing is really uh, all about service-based computing. And so it really has caused um, a lot of um, architects, system architects, software architects, to really rethink how we put together systems that serve the end users 
And to a certain degree, that's also going to affect our scientists that are moving to the cloud as well. All right, so let me also go through some of the things that cloud computing isn't. So it's not the solution for everything. Um, it's actually not the solution for everyone. I mean, there's some people, and particularly if you go back to the everything, uh, some use cases for which, say, only a supercomputer will do, uh, or other cases where, you know, only a mobile computer will do. So it's not really going to do everything you need it to do. Um, and, it, you know, in all, it's just it's not a silver bullet. But there is a fairly common set of use cases for which it may be the best thing going for what you need to do. All right, so why should we care? And by we, I'm including mostly you. I already care. <laughs> um, part of the reason is that more and bigger data are coming. Uh, here at EOS DIS, uh, we're expecting to see essentially an order of magnitude increase in our archive over the next few years. Uh, and so, you know, that's the problem with that. It's not just our problem. I mean, we can actually solve that problem because we're used to dealing with really you know, large and apparently unmanageable, unmanageable large sets of data. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of scientists out there are not really, you know, that's, that's not what you got into science for is learn how to manage really huge pieces of data. And so it's, it's not really in your core set of skills or even wants. Um, now, the second aspect is that scientists, by going to cloud for some of their needs, because they are able to process more, faster, and cheaper, they can get a competitive advantage in proposals. And so there's a certain you know, competitive aspect that um, makes cloud attractive in many cases. Um, and finally, you know, we are really starting to hear some direction from NASA headquarters. I know we're hearing it here in EOS this. I would not be surprised if you start seeing similar noises start coming down through the science programs, um, that we want to basically buy fewer computers and use more cloud for that computing. Um, and because of that, NASA's Earth observation data are moving to the cloud over the next few years. And uh, it's, it's going to be easier, it's going to be faster to work with that data in the cloud than, uh, than downloading these massive amounts outside the cloud in order to, in order to use. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the cloud fundamentals. And the first fundamental probably is what we call elasticity. Um, and by that, what I mean is that you can scale up, down, or even sideways the cloud resources that you want to use. So if you're looking at the CPUs that you need to do your analysis, for instance, um, you can talk about uh, using more CPUs to do more analysis, or maybe you just need to do a little bit, use less CPUs, that's scaling up and scaling down. By scaling sideways, what I mean is that you actually get a pretty good choice of different kinds of CPUs as well. So, for instance, if you go to Amazon Web Services, they've got stuff like memory-optimized CPUs, compute-optimized CPUs, even GPUs, if you want to start getting your feet wet with uh, GPU uh, turbo-driven, essentially, uh, computation. And lately, I've even noticed them offering uh, the ability to use FPGAs, uh, field, programmable, field Programmable Gate Arrays, for those of you that are wondering what that stands for. Um, now, the same goes for storage. You know, you can use more storage or less storage, um, and you pay for only the part that you, that you actually use. Um, you can go faster or slower. It can be local or web accessible. Um, and so again, you know, you see the up or down, and then local or web, web accessible is sort of from side to side. Um, and again, the elastic aspect means that you only pay for what you use. Uh, now, there's a corollary here, which people don't often get the first time. And, and that is that if you're not using it, you do need to remember to turn off the resources that you were using, or they will keep charging you for it. So it's sort of like turning the lights out when you go home. Um, now, there's another thing that has come along with cloud computing that you often hear the vendors talk a lot about. It's become kind of a jargon buzzword, but it's actually a very useful one. And they call it undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and what they mean by that, I'm going to try to explain that, is um, there's stuff for which you need your intrinsic earth science expertise to get done. You know, things like radiative transfer modeling and atmospheric correction, bias assessment, geophysical parameter retrievals, EOS analyses. In fact, 
These things are often part of the earth sciences core skills and core set of work. It's the value that they bring to the research is, you know, they have that better radiative transfer model. They have a better way of doing atmospheric correction or, you know, more accurate way of assessing bias or, you know, they get better accuracy on geophysical parameter retrievals. The stuff that you don't need earth science expertise for is stuff like ordering a computer, patching operating system, partitioning and formatting disks, calculating power and cooling requirements, and finding the floor space, handling the property tags. I mean, that's all stuff that, that pretty much anybody can do with just a little bit of training and some, some cookbook recipes. So it's not, you're not really adding value as a scientist if you're spending a significant amount of time doing this or even supervising people that do this. Um, now I mentioned I was going to talk about uh, cloud being service-based. Um, and by that, uh, we often talk about something as a service. And so the things you'll hear most often are infrastructure as a service. Um, when they say infrastructure as a service, what they mean is you get a virtual machine. It's running on a physical machine somewhere in the cloud vendors, you know, massive arrays of servers. Um, but all you really get is that virtual machine. Um, if you go up a step, what we call platform as a service is a case where you, you have a virtual machine, but it's essentially been preloaded with useful software. You know, so imagine you're uh, a user of uh, R for statistical analyses. Uh, a virtual machine or a, a platform, in this case, might be that machine with R installed and the modules that you usually use to work with, say, NetCDF data. That would be providing a platform as a service in this context. Um, and then there's software as a service, which is software that's accessed via the web, like Google Docs. And in fact, I'm actually doing this uh, presentation in the cloud using uh, Google Slides. And in this case, yes, you're running on the machine, but it's really, you don't know what kind of machine, you don't know where is it. I mean, it could be a quantum computer for all you know. Uh, it's probably not, but that would be cool. It's probably just, you know, a regular set of Linux servers. But the point is, is you don't even think about the machine or what it's running on. Um, and then the last thing, which you often won't see in some of the, the more generic uh, mass market materials is something that we call data as a service. And in this case, what we mean is where you're accessing the data through a software interface. So in essence, it's sort of one level up on top of that software as a service. So what service-based also means in terms of what it means for us is essentially everything can be coded. Even, you know, provisioning a new machine, a new virtual machine, bringing up a machine, bringing down a machine, doing anything you want to that machine or any of the layers on top of that, all of that can be coded and automated. Uh, in fact, that's what I've already said here, our, everything can be automated. Um, and also the details of how things really work underneath are hidden on purpose. So you really access things through the service interface without worrying about the exact details of how that service is implemented or is working behind the scenes. Uh, so if you look at the virtual machine case, you're using that virtual machine as a service. And again, you're not really conscious of exactly what kind of computer is sitting behind that. Although you do have that choice of the, of the different kinds of chips. Uh, so now I wanted to take a quick little interlude and talk about how that automation that I uh, mentioned, that automation is your friend. Um, and so we've been working in the cloud for a few years here, working with the cloud vendors, and, and we actually have some applications of our own up in the cloud. Uh, our common metadata repository, for instance, is in the cloud, and our Earth data search is in the cloud. Um, and I will admit that we've had some outages from time to time. So, you know, cloud is not going to be that silver bullet never go down, at least not at this point. However, the interesting thing about those outages, and we've actually seen some similar things happen in industry, is that when we do the root cause analysis for those outages, Almost every time it was somebody that was manually typing something in and they typed the wrong thing in. So even in those cases, we still get tripped up by that human factor, which means the more that we can automate, the fewer errors we're going to make and the, the longer and more reliably our various cloud things are going to stay up or run. So automation, you know, when you go into cloud, it's something to keep in, uh, to, to, to keep in mind is it's, 
it's really designed to be automation friendly. Uh, there's a lot of utilities that support it, and they, it, it really wants you to be automated. In fact, if you start dealing with bigger and bigger, you know, quantities of CPUs and disks, you start to see where, you know, at some point you really have to automate any management you're doing of those. All right. Now I'm going to go into the next phase, which is, you know, what good is cloud computing to an earth scientist? So the first and maybe the most obvious one is that you can go faster. And there's actually a couple things that play into this. Uh, one is that the commercial cloud CPUs are actually usually faster than the ones we have. You know, because of the procurement cycle and delivery and testing and all of that, um, we're, we're usually at least a few months behind, but we also hear rumors that the cloud vendors actually get the chips uh, from vendors about a year ahead of when they go out to the mass market. So pretty much any time we've done essentially a forklift migration of an application from uh, a local premise to on-premise machine to the cloud, we found a, some, something of a speed up. That's not a factor of two, but you know, we've seen 20 or 30 percent. That's nothing to sneeze at. And then you also saw the ability to use things like GPUs or FPGAs, which can also you know, provide faster um, performance just for the CPU. Um, but the big thing, the big multiplier, if you will, in cloud is that you can use as many CPUs as you want um, at a time. Um, so, I mean, technically, yes, there might be a limit, but you are not going to hit that limit. Um, and so the uses this has is, number one, it, it could be useful for near real-time processing. You know, if you've got processing uh, data that's basically processing a stream of incoming data, and your processing system, if it ever falls behind that 1x, often you can never catch up. Um, and so it's important to really stay ahead of near real-time processing and ideally, you know, process it many times faster than the data are coming in. And cloud is something that allows you to do that. Uh, the second thing it, it's particularly good at supporting is massive reprocessing campaigns. Uh, and so for those of you unfamiliar with this concept, um, when we produce standard data products uh, within EOS Disk or when the flight projects produce them to send to EOS Disk, uh, typically they reprocess the data from the satellite so oh, every year to three years maybe. Uh, because by then they've got a better algorithm, they've got a better handle on how the instrument is behaving, they've got new products they want to make. Um, and so when they do that, they often process through the entire uh, data record at the time. So if you, can, if you think about that, if you've got you know, five years of data to process, you certainly don't want to take five years to reprocess it. You want to be able to reprocess it you know, within a month, even within a couple of weeks. Um, so that that new data can get out to that user community that much faster. Um, and cloud computing is one of those things by marshalling many, many CPUs at a time that you can, uh, pro that you can do massive reprocessing much faster. And likewise, if you've got uh, analyses that are just very compute intensive, uh, for the same reason, uh, that can also be, uh, uh, cloud can also be a really good solution for that sort of use case. Uh, the fourth one, deep learning, that's kind of a new thing that's come, uh, that's come along fairly recently. So it used to be that um, when we worked with neural networks, you know, back in the 90s, uh, around the turn of the century, uh, the neural networks were actually usually fairly simple. They might be uh, one, two, maybe even three hidden layers at the very most. And the reason was is if you have a very deep neural network, you need a lot of data to train that, and you need a lot of CPU to basically process that training. Um, and one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why deep learning has really taken off lately is that now we can run much deeper networks because we've got much more CPU um, at our disposal. Uh, so, so in that area, it's actually been you know, a, a significant jump in the quality of the kinds of science that uh, we're able to do with that algorithm. Okay, so now, now that I've kind of given you an idea of uh, how we're using cloud to go faster, I'm going to produce a little pop quiz. I admit this actually worked better when I lectured in person, but uh, let's try it anyway. So if a compute optimized CPU with 16 cores costs you 80 cents per hour, and you need 1,000 CPU hours to compute your calculation, which is cheaper? One CPU running for 1,000 hours or 1,000 CPUs running for one hour? 
And I actually had people raise their hands. I got a, I got a mix of uh, results. Some people thought the first one was cheaper. Some thought the second one was cheaper. And uh, a small minority thought it was a trick question. Um, and they were right. It was a trick question. Because if you compute these out, uh, you come up with this, the same answer. It's $800 either way. And because it costs the same amount to get that processing done in an hour versus a thousand hours, you know, the argument is why not get the processing done now and then you have a lot more time to think about the results that have come out of it. Now, the second part after go faster is you can also go bigger. Um, and this is something that uh, scientists might not, it might not actually occur to scientists, uh, but there's the possibility of using many different levels of storage. So you have a lot of different tiers. One is uh, you've got stuff that's very fast and expensive uh, and easy to use. So there's something called EFS, which is elastic file storage. It can be accessed over the network from uh, other CPUs in the cloud, um, but it's 30 cents per gigabyte per month, which is kind of a lot. Um, if you go to the other end, you've got a product called Glacier within Amazon Web Services. Uh, Glacier used to mean basically that they stored it on tape. Um, nowadays, we're not so sure. They're kind of hiding that aspect from us. Uh, we suspect it's some kind of hierarchical storage mechanism that mixes tape and disk. But we don't really worry about it. All we really worry about is the cost and how fast the data comes back. And so it comes back kind of slowly from Glacier, but it's really dirt cheap to store huge amounts of data down there uh, to the point where it's really a quarter of a cent per gigabyte per month. So the second thing is, is you can have as much storage as you want, you know, depending on your budget. Uh, for instance, Netflix stores their entire library. Uh, I, we, we're pretty sure they store it in the Amazon Web Services Cloud, and we think they also have a backup in the Google Cloud. So that's a pretty substantial um, size of data. It's actually much larger than what we have within EOS Disk. Now, there's two different ways you could think of using these. So one is for short-term storage of large interim results. And remember, this goes back to only paying for the storage for the period of time that you use it. So if you basically you know, run your processing, store the you know, intermediate products in large storage, and then finish and delete that, you no longer charge for that, for that storage. On the other hand, the flip side of that is you might use the long-term storage for data that Oh, you, you might need again someday, so you don't want to throw it out. And I know a lot of scientists out there are like this because they have gone pawing through various supercomputing you know, installations, and you see gobs and gobs of data that nobody's ever touched. Um, but you don't know. You might need it again. So uh, storing something like that in Glacier could be a compelling use case for you. OK, and the third thing is that you can go cheaper. So again, this goes back. and. Uh, Sure, I've hammered this probably enough by now, but again, you're paying only for what you use. That goes for both the CPU and the storage. So anytime you're looking for short bursts of lots of processing, that's a good use for, for this use case. Uh, because think about it, if you, if you needed to do lots of processing for just short periods of time, and you were buying your own computers for that, you'd have to size those computers to be that peak processing level. But most of the time, you won't be running it at that peak. So, you're not really getting your money's worth. Um, and the same goes for lots of storage needed for a short time. If, if you need to store you know, 100 terabytes of data online, um, but you only need it for a week, it's much better to basically buy a week's worth of storage in the cloud than to buy you know, a 100 terabyte storage array, go through the procurement, the property tagging, the testing, the setting up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So especially if you only need it for a week at a time. Um, and then the last thing is that you can actually go simpler. And this takes a little bit more uh, explanation. And it's why I wanted to talk a little bit about this as a service idea. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at um, very closely within EOS Disk is this idea of providing data as a service. Um, and so this is the idea that we're providing quick access to pre-processed data. And maybe the most uh, famous example of this today is the Google Earth Engine where they've taken a lot of uh, data, Landsat, MODIS, uh, I think they might have some SMPP data in there, and they've basically put it into something like a data cube um, that the Google Earth Engine runs off of. And so you access that data through the Google Earth Engine 
not by you know, going in and reading individual blocks of data. Um, you've also got software as a service where you might run analysis on data via the web, and here ArcGIS is moving into the cloud. I know they've got an uh, ArcGIS Online offering in the cloud, I believe, and they might be looking at basically giving you an ArcGIS uh, virtual machine, if you will, which is a little bit closer to that platform as a service. Uh, so the platform as a service, remember, is using a virtual machine with analysis software pre-installed. Um, and then uh, if none of those work for you, of course, you always can fall down to or back to infrastructure as a service where you spin up a machine cluster or get a huge storage system in a matter of minutes. Um, and that, that could be particularly useful, for instance, when you're doing some exploratory processing before you win the money in the proposal that would pay for that. Uh, for that major cluster if you were going to buy your cluster. Uh, so it's a way basically of, of getting a, a much faster, bigger start, if you will, on working with your data than if you have to buy all of that hardware yourself. Um, uh, last thing is that uh, cloud, in a way, makes sharing easier. This is a, a bit of an indirect effect. Um, some of the things that we've sort of built along the way to make cloud work for us have also turned out to make things more shareable. Uh, one example that uh, I know scientists have been using for years and years, actually, is simply the ability to store data or results up in web accessible storage. And so Dropbox, that's actually a cloud service. Google Drive, also a cloud service. And then you can simply share the URL for where those things are with your colleagues. Uh, but something that you might not think about quite so much is that when you're running software as a service, and this doesn't hold for all software, but there's a, a, a number of software systems built this way these days. Giovanni is one of them, for instance, where everything you're asking for the service is essentially encoded within the URL. And therefore, you know, the software run that you run for a given URL is something that you can pass around, again, to your colleagues and they can reproduce what you did by reproducing, uh, by rerunning that URL um, in their browser, for instance. Um, so I wanted to give a, a practical example of where we, uh, where, and by we, I actually mean some folks at JPL who are primarily in charge of this, um, were able to really gain a lot. There was a case where they needed to do a massive reprocessing of uh, the orbiting was at the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, I believe it is, uh, too. And uh, in doing this reprocessing, they wanted to do it within a matter of weeks. If they'd done it with on-premise uh, hardware, it would have taken many months for them to, even to get the hardware to do it, as well as to run it through the amount that they could afford. Uh, so instead, they essentially did this on the cheap very quickly, again, within a matter of weeks, uh, reprocessed the entire OCO2 record uh, very, very quickly on the Amazon Web uh, System. Another example is the Above Science Cloud, uh, which is actually working on the ADAPT Cloud that is being, it's what we call a private cloud here on Center, which means that our NASA Center for Climate Simulation is basically running a cloud using hardware that lives at, uh, at Goddard. And they can get away with this because they're used to running huge hardware installations. Um, and so that kind of positions them to be a private cloud vendor. But uh, for the purposes of this slide, I actually wanted to point out not that so much as the fact that they are working on this. Uh, if you look at the bullet number four, uh, some of the key cloud and platform elements is there. They put together persistent data, sisters, uh, data services and uh, purpose-built virtual machines for those projects. And so they've really been sort of pushing the envelope a little bit on platform as a service for Earth scientists, essentially to serve these above science uh, investigators. Um, but of course, they also have to do the same things that a regular public cloud would do. By the way, when I say public cloud, I really mean commercial cloud like Amazon. And when I say private cloud, what I mean is something where a facility has themselves assembled a cloud within their own premises. Uh, it's a little confusing because here we're running private cloud in the public sector. Uh, so it's, <laughs> and public cloud actually refers to running 
are, let, let, let me back up, we're running private cloud in the public sector, and we're running public cloud in the private sector. Yeah, I think I got that right now. All right, so I promised I'd tell you what the catch is. And you shouldn't believe anybody that's telling you it's fantastic if they don't also tell you what the catches are. Um, the biggest catch, and I'll get into this a little bit, is that there's a new processing paradigm that you need to think about if you really want to take full advantage of the cloud. Uh, second is that uh, failures do happen. Uh, the third is that because cloud is so new and different, we're working through some policy challenges, let me say. And the fourth thing is called egress charges. I'm not going to explain that now. I'll explain it in a few slides. So the most important one, though, particularly for you, the earth science community, is this new processing paradigm. So I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is in, inside the cloud, if you want to get the speed up that you get from using many CPUs, you essentially have to spread your data around. Um, and so the, the classic paradigm that's used is we break up the data into, could be spatial tiles, could be temporal time stuff, could be a combination of both different variables, basically spread that data around. We then go and analyze those pieces on a, a wide range uh, or wide um, body of CPUs that are sitting close to the storage there. And then we come back and we reassemble that final result. Um, and so I, I'm the first to admit having some algorithms like, uh, having some algorithms myself that um, when I first write my algorithms, they don't look like this. And so uh, it takes a bit of refactoring existing algorithms in order to make them work like this and, and take full advantage of cloud. Uh, unless you've been very clever and have already done this, and in that case, I applaud you. Um, but it's also, you know, if you could think about this as you write new algorithms, it's definitely much easier to build into the algorithm from the start than to go back and retrofit or refactor your algorithm. So this is, this is sort of the main caveat to keep in mind. Okay, now that was the bad news. The good news is there's a bunch of packages and frameworks that help out with this. So there's a number of different distributed data stores, kind of come in two flavors. One is where it's a scalable database, and that database handles the scaling behind the scenes. Uh, the other one is a distributed file system. And the one that's the most famous, perhaps, is the Hadoop uh, file system. But there are other uh, file systems out there as well. Uh, the second thing that's out there are processing frameworks. And the, the sort of pioneer for this was the MapReduce framework. Um, lately, you hear a lot more about the Spark framework. That's really probably the leading, uh, the leading edge. It's the most commonly used, I would say, for doing this kind of massive data parallel processing. Now, one thing I do want to say is that, uh, and I don't have any numerical evidence to back this up, um, but it does seem like uh, the best confluence of bringing these frameworks and packages together tends to happen in the Python ecosystem. Um, so if you don't know Python, uh, which is a script computer language, but one that's very powerful and has uh, a lot of different communities behind it, including a fairly robust scientific computing community, um, it's a good language to learn because this is where a lot of these helper packages and frameworks are going to, uh, I think, hit the ground first, if you will, um, or, or for that matter, in its most sort of approachable form, if you will, because Python is fairly easy to learn, uh, even as scripting languages go. Okay, catch number two is failures. So let me start off with the bad news. If you're dealing with thousands of computers and thousands of disks, um, stuff is going to happen, right? Stuff is going to fail. It's virtually inevitable. Um, so you need to do a little thinking about that, not too much, because it's not your job really to handle all of that stuff. Um, a lot of the technologies that underlie cloud, that is the first problem that they have to solve is how to work with failures. And I admit, I didn't, I didn't really understand this myself until I went through some of the massive online courses on cloud computing, and they would go through a new technology, and uh, like the first thing they would talk about is how it handled 
inconsistencies or failures. And you know, the first few, it's like, why do they always start off with that? You know, why not start off with the good stuff? And the reason is, is because that is the first problem that any cloud technology needs to solve to make it into that cloud ecosystem. Now, having said that, though, your programs still need to be able to pick themselves up and restart on another node. Um, so if you are like storing precious, critical interim files in local storage in your algorithm, and that node goes down, that that local stuff is gone. And if that you know corrupts things that you're doing, or you you have no way of restarting that process, um, then then you do have a problem. Um, now. How you know whether you you choose to simply go back to the beginning for that particular piece, or somehow checkpoint and save it in persistent storage. You know, there's a number of different strategies that you can use for that. But you do have to consider that when you develop your processing algorithm, uh, particularly if you're going to be using, like I said, you know, lots and lots of CPUs. Uh, okay, right. That reminds me to talk a little bit about an interlude for for folks that kind of, you know do this failure to the utmost. And so I mentioned Netflix before and how they had really bought 100% into the cloud and into basically the Amazon Web Services cloud. Um, and of course, the last thing they want is for you know, their streaming movies to suddenly stop or for you to be able to try to get that, you know, the next episode of that TV show you were binging on and have it no, no longer found. Um, so they, their software has to be extremely conscious of fault tolerance. They have to be able to recover at the drop of a hat. And so to ensure that their entire system is like that, they have this thing called Chaos Monkey, which essentially goes out and terminates uh, nodes at random. Actually, they have different versions. They can terminate it at random. They can terminate it with a pattern. But the point is that this, this Chaos Monkey goes out, and, and I'm not talking about like their test instance of nodes either. I'm talking about their actual operating nodes. They want to make sure that stuff is going to recover um, after the chaos monkey has gotten to it and uh, terminated some of the nodes. Uh, chaos monkey now, I think, is uh, actually out in open source for anybody to use. You probably don't need it until you're really worried about you know those 2,000 node systems that need to stay up all the time. Um, but it, it makes me feel a little better somehow to know the Chaos Monkey is out there and ensuring that all of the cloud software and uh, systems that underlie it are resilient to the failures that it induces. All right, catch number three is policy stuff. Um, for those of you outside of NASA, that this might not be quite as important, although I'd, if you're at a university, you definitely want to check university policies as well. Um, so we have the questions like, where and how do I get these cloud resources? How can I use, learn to use the cloud safely? And then, you know, what about the security policies? And there is no easy answer to these because it's dependent from one environment to another. Uh, we've been learning a lot of lessons here at NASA in moving EOS disk systems to the cloud. And uh, we're working with some of our colleagues, uh, both within NASA and other institutions, to trade lessons learned on that sort of thing. Um, and catch number four is egress charges. And this is something that is unique to cloud. Uh, basically, they charge you for moving bits from the cloud to your machine, back out to your machine. Okay, for the, so the first gigabyte per month is free, but after that, they, you can see they, they start to charge you. The charges aren't really exorbitant, but it still is kind of an indication that you want to analyze as much as you can in the cloud to reduce your output size so that you don't take you know, unexpectedly large hits in pulling your data back out. If you can do all of your work inside the cloud, you can avoid egress charges entirely. So how do you get started with cloud? So many vendors will offer free, free tiers for learning. Some of them you know, will last a year or give you a certain amount of free stuff. Um, there's a lot of online training out there. You know, not just in regular cloud stuff, but there's even be, uh, beginning to be more and more training in how to use cloud for scientific computing. Uh, so all you have to do is you know, Google, check out some of the massive online open courses. We'll have some stuff there. Um, we are going to be working on more how to cloud seminars here at Goddard. And uh, we'll kind of test drive them here, and if they look good, look good for the larger community, we may also bring them out to this larger seminar, uh, webinar community. 
Um, we'll be trying to share uh, short learning ramp ways to start using cloud, getting examples from colleagues that have used cloud. But you know, what we'd also like to hear, and I've put this in the post-survey questions, is you know, what cloud things would you like to see? Um, and then one last thing, you know, getting started, don't forget about the Python thing. You know, if, if you can find a little time to learn how to use Python to work with science data, and it's got modules for HDF data and NetCDF data and all that nice stuff. Um, if you could spend a little time doing that, that will benefit you in the end in moving to cloud. All right, and with that, I think I'll close and uh, take any questions and or requests. And again, we've got that post poll, uh, that post talk poll to put in your requests for other things you might like to see. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. So at this point, we'll give these end polling questions about three minutes or so, and from there, we'll move directly to the Q&A period, and uh, we'll take any of your questions. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll give this about three minutes. All right, everybody, we're going to give this just another minute or so, and then we'll move to the Q&A period. All right, everybody, at this point, let's go ahead and move to the Q&A period. And there was actually a question that was uh, posed within the polling questions, Chris, so if you don't mind, I'd like to um, ask that question first. There was a comment made early on, you mentioned cost and maybe also scheduling system that involves no a priori, how much memory and how many CPUs you will need. Are there tools for this? 
Uh, right. So that's a great question. Um, and it kind of comes down to two different things that you need to know. One is what the, what the execution profile of your own code is. And then the other would be how that maps into, you know, what you're running in the cloud. So the good news is that practically every computing language has a way of determining what kinds of resources you're using when you run the tool uh, or when you run your code. Uh, but the bad news is that it's virtually, it's different for virtually every language. And for many cases, there's more than one profiling tool. Uh, so for the language that you're working with, uh, you know, look for things that talk about how to profile your algorithm. Um, and that'll give you an idea of uh, how much CPU it takes and how much memory it takes. Now, in terms of how that maps to the CPUs that uh, you would get from the cloud vendor, that's a bit more complicated. And uh, I, I'm sure there are tools that help that, but I have to admit that I'm not intimately familiar with that. Uh, so it's a great question. It's one I'm going to go back and start learning more about, because I think it's one of the things that we might be able to provide as some extra information or service to the users that want to work in the cloud with the data. OK, thank you, Chris. Are there any additional questions? All right, great. <clears throat> the next question is, are there any plans for cloud training for earth scientists? Uh, well, uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, exactly what those plans are is that that's a little bit more fuzzy. And that's where we really want to hear from the earth scientists. So this, in essence, was uh, uh, lecture zero of that series, I suppose. and. Uh, as I mentioned, we are doing a series here locally at Goddard, which is doing about one, I think, one webinar per month, roughly. Uh, we occasionally do webinars in, in other areas. Um, and so what I'd be looking for, I think, is some guidance from the end user community as to what kinds of things they'd like to learn about cloud after they've seen this particular talk, maybe gone out and poked around a little bit in the cloud and Python ecosystems and then come back with, you know, some more, hey, I'd really like to learn about this or that. So, so the answer is yes, we will be doing something more, but we need information from you on how to properly focus that, I think. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions? Anybody? Okay, well, while we're waiting to see whether or not there are additional questions, um, I just wanted to note that this webinar has been recorded. I will provide a recording link to Chris Linus for distri distribution, and I can also send it out directly to all registrants for this, for this webinar. So that should be sent out in the next couple of days. Any further questions from anybody? Okay, the next question is, if, you, if I have an AWS compute instance ready to analyze Earth data, how do I find Earth data? Ah, uh, yes. So the way that you find Earth data, the best place to go, for at least for NASA's Earth science data, which is all I can speak for here, is that we have a user uh, search tool called search.earthdata.nasa.gov. Is there a place I can type it in? Let me, let's try this. I've entered it into the, um, I've entered it into the Q&A pod. Okay. Now, I will say that most of the, the very little of our data is in the cloud right now. In fact, none of the publicly available data is in the cloud yet. Um, we will start to see more data go into the cloud. Actually, I take that back. Some of the Alaska satellite facility data is in the cloud. Um, but that, I think, is the only case where we've got data in the cloud. All the rest is scheduled to go over the next few years, I think, is the best that I can say. It's probably going to be an extensive process because we have a lot of current data holdings. Uh, there was a question a bit earlier on if you could um, provide a brief status on the ESDIS Cumulus project. Uh, sure. So as this cumulus is rolling right along, um, Katie Baines has been leading that on the ESDA side. Uh, we basically had our 
uh, prototype review back in August with headquarters and, and got the go-ahead to proceed to the next phase. And so in that phase, we'll be working to get uh, data from several of the DACs into Cumulus um, over the next couple of years. Thank you, Chris. Are there additional questions? I'm looking. I'm not seeing any additional questions here. All right. Well, if there are no additional questions, then I leave it to Chris to wrap up with any closing remarks. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to me. Uh, this is going to be a group effort, you know, EOS this plus its end user community if we're really going to take the maximum advantage of, of this. Um, and uh, by the way, if any of you think of questions later, uh, just go ahead and email me at chris.linus at nasa.gov, um, and I can try to point you to the right uh, answers. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. At this point, what we will do is we'll log off from the audio component. I'll leave the virtual space open for another 10 minutes or so. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A log.